Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. Happy New Year, everybody. And we are continuing, nearly finished now, our run of shows looking at the Ardennes Offensive, the Battle of the Bulge. And if you've been sticking with the shows, we had some great shows. William Nance, Peter Caddick Adams, uh, the, the fourth Armoured Medics one was superb. One of the recurring theme, themes has been that kind of failure to find some of the missing, some of the dead for weeks, if not months after, after the fighting because of the snow. Uh, and that's something that we're going to talk about today. But my guest, uh, Dr. Nina Jans, is from the University of Luxembourg. She has studied a lot about the German burial system, both at the Eastern Front and in her home country of Luxembourg. So we're delighted to have her. So good evening, Nina. How are you today? Good evening. I'm good. So as you said, heard in the top of the show there, the, the, you know, we all got, you're going to take us through the whole history of burials and how it works with the German military and also looking at some of the burials of allied point of, uh, pilots and what have you ended up in Luxembourg. Um, your study, is it something, is it easy to study how, how this all works or do you find yourself reaching a, a limit of what information is available? It's of course difficult always to study war and violence and death. Um, I see out of photographs, pictures, very, very, of course, not nice pictures. You get kind of used to that. I mean, I'm studying like the Second World War over 10 years now. And uh, you do, I'm, I'm a professional historian, so I'm objective or I try. Nobody's objective completely, but of course, I, I'm trying to be objective and just to, to blend out if I go home. Um, but it's, of course, not e easy. But I find this topic very fascinating and the, Every time when I travel somewhere, I have to go to our military cemetery. So it's it's like a obsession a little bit as well. Um, and because this is what left, or what is left from the war. So we don't know the people anymore. So I don't know anybody. So the witnesses are, are dying. So the last veterans are not um, among us anymore. And so this is like the last traces of the war. I mean, the cities are built up again and you don't see anything more. But the cemeteries and the names, this is what remains and what's like for me and my students. I also like to go with my students to the cemeteries and just tell them, please look at it, go through the uh, files here with the names and just look at it. I think it's better than a history book. Definitely. Well, exactly. I mean, as a, as a Normandy guy myself, I mean, that the cemeteries are the link between the past and the present, aren't they? Because you can see them today, but you can, you, you're reading dates from, in this case, 77 years ago and more. So they are that first port of call for lots of people when they're, as you say, visiting battlefields where there aren't perhaps any, any real reminders. Perhaps, as you said, that the cities have been repaired, the battlefield damage has gone away, but the cemeteries still remain. They are the, they are the, the, they, they educate us by just visiting them. So you're going to take us through the burial and the cemeteries of German soldiers. So I'm going to hand over to you for the presentation. And folks, if you've got questions for Nina, please fire away and we will, we will address them as we go through. But I'm looking forward to learning a lot about this. So over to you, uh, Dr. Jens. Thank you so much, Paul, for the invitation first, of course, and then the introduction. So um, I would like to share with you my very short my outline, what uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, Paul. Thank you. So I would like, before going into detail about the burials of the Second World War, why is it so special or um, like the development? Why it is like very, like to treat the military dead or like the soldiers, um, even like the average soldiers, because it is something special. Because 200 years ago, it was not, uh, like the same treatment yet. So and then I would like to share with you some um, various pra practices, uh, regulations in the Wehrmacht, uh, like the ideal burials, and then of course in the daily combat. And then um, I would like to share with you some examples from the Battle of Bulge in Luxembourg itself, and then after the war, like the reburials, the search for the dead, and then also the construction of the permanent cemetery. So this is my outline for today, and then I would like to start already with the introduction. So what I already said, um, so the soldiers, like why is it so special? Of course, like humankind, I mean, this is like one of the oldest rituals we have, uh, even with Stone Age, um, 100,000 years ago, people had already the traditions 
rituals to bury the dead or to do something with the dead, even burning, bury, whatever. But it was like, of course, like since um, humans can remember, I would say, uh, they kind of dealt with the dead. But of course, um, like uh, somebody who died violent, violently uh, is something like different than somebody who's, who died out of sickness or of um, age. We know all about the warriors, like the big generals, like the army leaders, um, like Alexander the Great, for example, had like an old mausoleum or like an old tomb or like um, military leaders of the Vikings were buried with their swords in a um, tomb somewhere. So it, kind of here, it's, it's just like the leaders, but um, the average soldier, like it's just, um, still very very new uh, but we uh, take care of the average uh, soldiers for example here we have like the mount of marathon uh, here it's something special because the athens uh, kind of buried even the average soldiers but in in a an, in a ground or like in a hill but this is something very very rare but because in in general even in the middle ages and then even uh, before in the, let's say, 17th and 18th century, uh, during a battle, the average soldiers were just remained there. So nobody took care of them. So it, even if uh, they were just removed from the villagers, from, from the surrounded uh, populations because of, of course, um, sickness, uh, because they polluted like the decaying corpses, um, polluted the air and the water, for example. So after a, a battle end, um, the corpses were looted, so of course, like for some, the weapons were taken even by the enemies or by the by the same comrades because the weapons were expensive. But uh, also clothes or boots were were taken from their um, corpses, and then they were just put into mass graves. And maybe if they had, they were lucky, they were maybe like a priest said like a little prayer, and that's it. So there wasn't any grave sign any name or even the family was notified at all in the um let's say in the 18th century um even until 1800s um the napoleon war in russia uh, there wasn't like any no notification for the family so maybe the officers of course and here again like the military leaders uh, got like a special treatment sometimes this the body were embalmed and sent home but of course, in the 18th century, it took like weeks to send somebody home and it was very expensive. So what I want to say is there wasn't like a military, like a regulation system for the dead. So it, it was just um, either you fight or you die and that's it. So there wasn't any um, somebody who took, took care of you. This, of course, changed uh, with the national movements, etc. Uh, here again, um, like uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, because the, the majority of the dead um, didn't die even on battlefields. They died later on uh, out of um, like injuries, sickness in the hospitals. But even there, they were just put into mass graves and taken care of. Uh, sometimes outside the city, like there are in Germany, many many mass graves of the um, Napoleon army, like retreating from Russia. Um, many just um, well didn't make it home, and but and the family never heard of them. So of course either they came back or not. So this, uh, for example, this condition or this um, let's say achievements were not there yet. So. But uh, we are coming to that. Um, next slide, please, um, Paul. Here. Because if we talk about like, like the, the burials of Second World War, of course, we, we know all, I mean, we talked about it, but Normandy, uh, also a First World War, like this uh, marble uh, cemeteries of uh, British, French, and Americans, like long, long lines, and until the horizon just crosses. This wasn't very, this wasn't like a matter of course in the um, 18th century. So what happened? So it how did the average soldier became so important? Um, I mean, there, I can talk about it like longer, but I know I would like to, to go faster to the Second World War. Um, here we have... Well, just, just, just to interrupt you for a second, Nina. 
is yes. it is part of the transition as we get toward the 20th century and we're talking about the size of wars of the first world war and the second world war you start having the the draftees the armies start get stopped being just professional armies it becomes everybody going away and maybe back in the in you know three or four hundred years ago you accepted when you became a soldier that you probably weren't going to get a burial if you got killed because it went with the job of being a soldier but the first world exactly. war even the american civil war it starts becoming everybody's fight and you're going to war even if you're not really wanting to be a soldier so maybe there's a movement to kind of therefore you would expect to get buried at the end of it is is that part of the transition yes i mean i mentioned like the national movements very very quick uh, maybe not um, detailed enough i know for example the uh, the mercenaries exactly uh, they were paid to fight and if you were killed well it's just like like a, a side effect or just a disadvantage of the job it was just the job in, in general that's that's true um, of course, there were in the um, 19th century already. Also in Luxembourg, there were like there was like a garrison uh, of the Prussians. So there were because there was like a federal German uh, like confederacy. You say that in in English, um, yeah. they had like an own garrison and they had like a garrison cemetery, like where they they didn't fight the Prussians here in Luxembourg. But of course, some people died of accidents of of sickness, right? So they had like an own military cemetery there, and they were buried because they had like the time but yes you're completely right that it's um it's a matter of fact that uh, if you're drafted that you like you you have you when you are in the national army and then you, you fight uh, for something for example the the mercenaries in the baroque or in the in the middle ages before they fought for the money but yeah. as the soldier you were like drafted or conscripted then by your nation then you like that's why the national movements, you know, it, it it started because you became you became like a citizen, and also you identified yourself. Not everybody, but you identified yourself as like German or like a Bavarian, um, a French, like not German, but of course Germany didn't exist uh, like in the eighteen sixties, for example. But still, you you identified yourself as a Bavarian, and you fight, for example, for your king. So you're something so you, you you became kind of important either either for the king for the country to defend the country so then it started slowly that you were like recognized as as an individual as a citizen you as a citizen you became important so you kind of um your deeds or your 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 life is important for the king for the for the country for the fatherland for the motherland doesn't matter and then of course if you die then something also like a consequence that you deserve or you 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 get this like this recognition of the individual life was a little bit um became more important and so that's why you um de deserved like a grave you know first of all um, the oh, the single soldier had to be like respected either for from society and also of course from the state authorities and from the military but it's you are important enough, but we will give a grave for you, even it's a lot of effort, a lot of work. And yeah. then you know, kind of you kind of deserve a grave. You are you 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 become like dignified enough to be respected even in death. That yeah, was you're, like, you're fighting for a principle, so therefore that principle that you're fighting for, whether it's a king or a country or a cause, mm -hmm. you kind of earn yeah. the right to keep to be buried at the end of it. As opposed to the, the, as you say, the earlier era of it being mercenaries fighting for gold or fighting mm -hmm. for prestige. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Do you want to move on to the next slide? Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was was too fast. <laughs> I wanted to to say a little bit about the humanitarian. Um, yeah, exactly. Because even um, you, the citizen or the soldier, individual became important, but also like the war became more like human humanitarian um for example we know or everybody knows andre dunant like the founder or like the pre-father of the red cross he kind of said this is not possible that people are um like dying uh, on the battlefield no no no, no professional doctors nurses there's, there's nothing there it's just uh, no no like system and also then for the dead so it became kind of important more and more that and the individual fate or the individual like um life and death 
of course, of a soldier became more important. And then it started this uh, um, hate peace treaties, like an end of the 19th century, and then, of course, the beginning of the 20th century, etc. So it, it, it started like to human, uh, humanitize, yeah, we will say, like the war, and then ended in the Geneva Conventions. And of course, the G Geneva Conventions uh, started, I mean, like the, the, the most important one was 29. And then, of course, um, in the 40s again, so it's kind of that everybody has like the right to be um, treated first, to get medical treatment, like even as an enemy, you even you're captured. This is because this was it like I was aiming for, that you get like a medical treatment, uh, that you get, you have the possibility to write home, that you, you have the possibility to, um, to have like a, sleeping place or i don't know you're not like um how you are not um completely like murdered or something or, or and even if you die for example the hague treaties and then of course the first geneva convention in 29 was meant was like um considered more for the pow's so it was more like to to treat pow's um like equally and but everybody gets like the right to like food and sleeping place and of course be uh, in contact with the family. So it's, it started like that. So this was my uh, wanted wanted just to say uh, from the last slide here, and then we can um, move on already, or maybe there are already some questions. No, no I think we're good. We can move on. To the war. <laughs> um, I think I I skipped that as well. Um, for example, the first like pure military cemetery like but um but for like i said sometimes there were just mass graves if the soldiers were buried they were like maybe buried in 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 um civilian cemetery somewhere for example in the prussian uh, french war in um 1870 71 um this the soldiers got already single graves but they were like sometimes just buried somewhere uh, mostly in like next to civilian cemeteries, but the first one was like in the, the American Mexican War uh, in Kentucky. So it was like it says it's kind of like the first like pure military cemetery for just military dead. So this is considered as like the first one on the American continent. In Europe, of course, like I said already, it started with um, 1870, but of course the First World War, right? right mass death and of course like the military and the society had some somehow deal with the dead uh even the military for the for example for the militaries was important to know who um also for the strategy um like the losses like the casualties i mean like a casualty can be also of course like missed injured uh, captured etc but uh what happened to them um so of, of of course to get like um substitute uh, from from the home country um so we not we need to know who's dead or or who's injured of course when they started like this grave registration already in the first world war so everything what comes now <laughs> for the second world war even for the wehrmacht was kind of a experience already from the first world war so it, it started but the army um had also um like um like regulations or like requirements um how to um bury somebody of course it was like copied from the Christ our christian rituals uh to have with a grave there was like there were sometimes uh ideas of to 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 cremate uh the soldiers uh, because of the space but um so it, it it kind of remained with the single graves grave registrations i mean how we know the cemeteries um, from the first world war in flanders right in in belgium yeah. in france everywhere so this was very an, an important step in my talk today <laughs> but uh, the wehrmacht also learned from that so even before uh, the wehrmacht entered the second world war or started the, first, the second world war they had already for their own military like uh, um, regulations for the peacetime of course for example they were before um before uh, 35, there were professionals, and some professionals, a soldier, I mean, professional soldiers, could have died by accidents, injuries. So, and they had, yeah. of course, own garrison cemeteries, um, like they called it in German, like warrior cemeteries or army cemeteries. And there was like a regulation 
as well, like, um, like uh, um, how the ceremony should look like. I mean, I, I will come to that on the next slide. I will uh, say, uh, say that. But then, uh, well, the German Reich attacked Poland in September 39. Uh, they didn't have like an like a department like for like so something like an information for losses or casualties. So they just um, created that after the attack even. But they needed that, like I said before. Of course, every uh, army has to know what the heck, how many soldiers they have in the field, or how many um, do we need more, or etc. So this uh, information office, I call it in English, um, of course had of course registered um, casualties, injuries, captured soldiers, and the dead soldiers. So this was the whole detour <laughs> to explain the um, regulations. And here we have um, something very, let's say, determined, very um, um, detailed, because when they, they um, graded already in 39, and then the beginning of 40, uh, like a big booklet, a very thick booklet with regulations just for the burials. So, so you can see here, for example, they thought all about like the grave marks or the grave signs, how they should look like. And you can see here, it's like an iron cross, like the symbol of the Wehrmacht. And then it should be like a swastika on it, uh, the name, and um, where did he die? Uh, of course, birth, um, birth date, death date, and then the rank. And you can see on the other picture on the left side, uh, it's a propaganda picture. So I have to say that you can see here. Uh, I mean, of course, based on the regulations, uh, a, a cemetery. Um, you can see that these crosses were painted and very detailed. And you can see even little stones, little little paths, flowers. Of course, I mean, don't forget it's like a propaganda picture. But anyway. It's um, even in at the Eastern Front on the Crimean Island, but it's it's it looks like a lot, a lot of work, a lot. <laughs> I, I say that here now, and so this is like the ideal version of what the Wehrmacht um, um, created. That's why I chose like this picture to to show you. They kind of thought about everything. Also, you know what. Um, size even there was like in the booklet like a whole like one-to-one -one, a measurement for the cross it's just um so but every soldier or every like a responsible had to have that in his pocket to be prepared to bury and to construct big cemeteries next slide please i mean Mark, um, i just want to just add a little comment here i mean yeah. when we look at the german army or the german military in world war ii of course the first part of the war is defined by the speed with which Germany are expanding its empires. I mean, they're going into numerous countries at the same time. So we're talking about the Western, you know, Poland, Denmark, Norway, France, all in a matter of weeks. Then a year later, they, they, they are Barbarossa begins and they start in other countries. So at the beginning of the war, I can see the problem of just keeping up with the expansion is going to be a massive problem. Then when we get to the second part of the war, which will be the focus of the Ardennes, is when the Germans are losing the war, that begins to bring its own problems in because of a shortage of everything else, materials and time and personnel. So it seems that both parts of the war, that the, 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 the Germans are kind of making themselves a quite a, an impossible task to maintain the kind of standard of that photo you showed us a minute ago, because that's you're setting out a very a very um, expensive um Cemetery sit, sit up. Yes, um, I wanted to to come to that later, but I uh, answer that now. So there were each unit had a, a, a responsible for the burial. So it was like mostly like a priest in the division, for example. But every unit had like had like a burial command, like one responsible, and then of course like volunteers or uh, not volunteers but they had to help to bury like immediately the dead um there was uh, like instructions as well so the the the, the germans um the dead germans had to be buried like immediately where they died so not like of course like to collect the graves a little bit together not like every like on the street on the next on at the street so they were like collecting points sometimes in the division 
like bigger divisions. And that was like this grave officer who was responsible then to construct the cemeteries. And then it was in the um, rear um, region, there was like another professional grave command or grave officer who worked directly under the, um, in, in, uh, for the high command, like uh, for the OKV, for this information uh, um, bureau or for this office. Um, he was then responsible for like bigger regions, of course, but uh, he had like his own people and they kind of cleaned up behind the division or behind the units. So they kind of reburied a lot, a lot of, of people and they exhumed um, Many they they identified them. They they tried uh, sometimes even with the with uh, teeth, uh, with some X-ray pictures to identify the, the other people. So everything was uh, so the the burial every, until the last small detail. Everything was unregulated. You know how deep the, the grave should be, um, how to identify them, how to the dog tag, um, how to put like well because there was like one um, like two halves. And then one had to be removed, but one half what what the like dead had to wear about around the neck uh, to stay with the body, and then the other had to be sent to Berlin for the registration, and then of course for the registration to the to the family, and of course in the statistics later on. I mean that's why I said even for the military itself, it was very important to know that. So there was like a professional. I saw here questions uh, if there were professional. Um, ah, did the Germans have specific burial units? So yes. So first of all, um, directly at the um, at the front, like responsible, but they had more the, well order just to bury fast, but efficient, um, like detailed. I mean, I will I will come to that later. That's it. detail. What does it mean? Detailed. Uh, it's not always possible. But and then of course behind them. Um, they cl cleaned up, kind of. So they built, they constructed already during the war big cemeteries. So they reburied, exhumed already thousands, thousands, one hundred thousands of soldiers. And this was possible. Yeah, you can be right. It depends, of course, on the territory and on the on the time. So in the West, they had like more time for that. Not in the Battle of the Belt, <laughs> right? But. Um, in, in France, um, they had time even sometimes to um, reconstruct the military cemeteries from the First World War. So they started even building up uh, like nicer ones because the First World War cemeteries uh, were, uh, well, were most of them abroad from the German Reich. So they were mostly very simple and modest, gray and boring for the Nazis. So they wanted, of course, to rebuild them and make them bigger to include them into the hero global um, um, hero ideology, which the like Wehrmacht soldiers were also put into that. But this is another topic. This is not today. We're going to talk about it. But um, so yes, in especially in 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 the West, um, I saw photo albums, pictures um, like. Um, construction measurement of um, building they built streets for the cemeteries they, they built like canals and and um, to 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 water the plants so uh, it was like big efforts were done um to to construct already during the war cemeteries permanent cemeteries um there were already plans of what would happen after the war if the Wehrmacht would have been um, successful there were Sometimes even great, very crazy plans in the east, um, like big tombs and big uh, hills, uh, fortresses for the, the, the heroic um, German soldiers uh, to construct. But of course, like we know, didn't come to that. Um, yeah, but so this is what I um, wanted to share. That there were like two parts, of course, and many, many um, sometimes not even. Um, you cannot compare sometimes East, Eastern Front with the Western Front, of course not. But there were sometimes even at the Eastern Front, um, I think I will have also uh, a picture of the big monumental cemetery they built already. And this, of course, depends. I mean, this was, of course, before 42 or 43. Definitely. Wow. And this, this photo we've got here, this is this is the peacetime ceremony. So there's 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 flags, there's a there's music, drummers. Um, obviously, that wasn't going to continue into the, to the war itself. But I mean, 
this was all set up so pre-war this is all this this is how it should be in an ideal situation this is actually starting out but august 42 so and I, he, he was an officer so uh, even the Wehrmacht said everybody will be equally buried. So even generals were put into the same um, rows as the average soldier. So I, I, what I experienced, the Wehrmacht continued, uh, did, did that actually. So a general um, sometimes, of course, if somebody f um, died at the front, very rare, right? Uh, like who died? Um, some, but not everybody. Most of them maybe died at home or in airplane crashes or committed suicide. But anyway, uh, this is an officer and he became, um, well, he had like a ceremony. Yeah, you, you can see with, with a coffin, um, there was, in the peacetime, there was like the regulation to use coffins for every soldier, but of course it wasn't possible to use for everybody a coffin. And you can see this coffin was actually very like handcrafted and this also like in, you would see in, in, in peacetime. But most of the soldiers were uh, buried like just in their clothes. Or um, one regulation said we, they should use uh, sleeping bags. But I doubt that. But it, it happened of course, but I doubt that. I think so many if, if especially in the winter, even uh, what I said about this middle age, uh, like medieval battlefields that they were like looted, I think even like the, the German comrades uh, took also maybe something. I mean, we know that that um, many um, Wehrmacht soldiers uh, took off the boots of Soviet soldiers, they were like better, and or it was very, very cold and they took off their um, clothes um, their like jackets to be to, to be worn or even boots so it has so this picture that's why it's it's um it's i i know it's uh, not the reality but it, it it's it's a real picture of course it's of course uh like from the propaganda com the company um but still it, this is rare very very rare that you see like a, somebody in a coffin at the eastern front and uh, the whole, um, say, command, like the whole, um, uh, like, I'm looking for the word in my head, um, like a, the, the, with the honor company. Honor like guard, this, honor guard yeah, section, yeah. Guard. yeah. Thank, you, thank you, I was looking for that. And this is, this is very, very rare. Um, here I, I wrote down the uh, burial ceremony in the peacetime. But of course, this was completely uh, during the daily combat. Of course, not it couldn't be followed. There, sh there was a regulation that every soldier had to be uh, buried in a single grave and with the last military honors, even if it's just uh, like the salute, even it is just or just let's like, let's say then in the end of the war is like then the um, um, Hitler uh, greeting. Of course, but yeah. uh, everybody uh, had to be like um, like put into rest. How how we say that with the last military honor. But even yeah. that is was not um, it was not realistic at all. Uh, I, I I read many many complaints from the professional grave officers who said um, that it should be um, like a duty for every living German soldier to thank the comrades that they kind of fought with them so it was like an honor to say goodbye and it wasn't like an honor to uh salute in front of them and sometimes they just were sitting next to their um com dead comrades even like decaying corpses and they didn't do anything i think they were so i mean we know that from from letters, they were so dull. It, it was just so exhausting, like a war that you sometimes you don't care anymore. I mean, we we heard. I mean, I read that a lot. You know, of course, um, how like the other side, <laughs> let's say, like Americans um, dealt with German um, bodies or German dead soldiers or the Soviets the other way around also and also of course the Germans what they did with the Soviet uh, soldiers it's also completely different but even German soldiers with their own comrades really didn't follow anymore because they they couldn't um, more um, to 
bury and bury and bury anymore. It's just some like it, the it, it's just, sorry to interrupt you, Nina, but that's something you even in the Pacific campaign you read. The more brutal the campaigns, the more death there is around you, whether you're American, British, Canadian, you know, Japanese, the, the, the more you get used to death, the more it seems that you don't get round to burying the dead, either your own dead or the enemy dead. It's the, the brutality of that situation seems to be make it that burying the dead doesn't seem to be important. You see pictures in the Pacific the Marines traipsing along in columns past their own war dead that no one seems to be interested in. I think it's just the brutality of war seems yeah. to just block those things out. It's a fascinating aspect, but um, yeah. Um, so are we, are we next slide now? Yes, please. So here we are. So here's, here's one of the larger ones. So I'll hand back this to you. Crimea Island. Island. Exactly. So this was my uh, example. This was an, it's, it's an actual picture. So it's not, it's, even it's like black and white, it's from the wartime, that's why it seems a little bit like painted, but it's an actual picture. And uh, you can see here, I think the, uh, over 10,000 uh, relying from the 107th Infantry Division and also Crimean Island, uh, 42. You can see here, of course, like 43 and then 44 is anyway, uh, will be completely, uh, would look different. But uh, I have here like a diary of this grave officer. That's why it's very, very interesting. So I know how long it took to build the cemetery. So it took uh, nine weeks in summer. And I, that's why I'm so surprised that they had time to do that or with efforts like the strength or the mood to do that. Of course, they were professional they had this was their job but even for the other soldiers because they used uh, from the division and um, they used a kind of like uh, 20 of the soldiers but and then they used of course 80 civilians they said right. in the report it means of course forced labor so this is this happened a lot uh, but we're like prisoners of war um, built the cemeteries let like, dig the graves and you can see here, I mean, they, it's like an, a belt on a, on a mountain. Um, you can, um, they describe that they have like pipes for the plants. They have a little chapel and they had to bring cement and or sand from the city. And it <laughs> sometimes you think, just why? It's, it's um, just unbelievable that they built something like, like that. But I think even before the war got very, very brutal, um, maybe it was for the like a uh, sense, like uh, maybe to, to be busy, just to 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 keep, to, to, yeah, to be uh, not think about every time about the war. Um, even if you build like cemetery, but you can maybe build like a wall, or you can like build like a stone memorial there. But this is one of the rare examples. But this is very rare. Um, I've seen at the eastern front uh, in in the. In Western Europe, it looked different, of course. Um, uh, there were like bigger ones. Uh, also, also like I said, already the First World War cemeteries, they started building that. Uh, also very surprising, but this is uh, Eastern Front, one of the rare examples I've, I found. Exactly. Exactly. And next slide here is, uh, you can see that it looks a little bit different. Even, um, so the grave, sign at the beginning i've i've shown you with the swastika with the iron cross um, you, you couldn't do that i mean there was like a lack of material mostly wood in the russian step difficult of course in the Ardennes it looked uh, different because we were in a forest but we had a winter so it was of course very difficult because of the frozen earth and um some some uh, grave units use for example mines or just blew up uh, explosives to dig some um well to 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 dig the graves but it was of course not even not always possible because they used of course the explosives or the mines for defense or for attacks etc uh, the americans had the same uh, problem here of course um then they maybe stapled the dead they uh they were maybe then then frozen to each other they couldn't be like separate anymore and so it was of course very very difficult here um i have most examples from eastern front because this is what uh my uh, main focus was before um focusing on the Luxembourgish uh, history. 
as you can see here, the even they are like single graves, so it was still like important, like to put them into single graves if you had the time to even bury them. But you can see here the the, the grave signs look completely different. Um, sometimes you know they just use what was there, even like the snow graves there, and the winter graves are kind of still um, identifiable. But even I think after one winter, you couldn't see them anymore. Honestly, I don't know what happened to these exact graves. I mean, we can all imagine um, this what, what happened to them. They were completely uh, lost. Uh, yeah. The grave signs were removed um, by the lo locals. Um, it was in Eastern Europe different. I mean, I will, I will, uh, my examples in Luxembourg, I will, I will tell you that in the end. But uh, so the reality looked well, completely different from this, even from this Crimean cemetery from 42 and also from the ideal grave sign with the swastika and the iron cross. Okay, now we are already in the so back from Eastern Front to Luxembourg. So here, like I said, the, the German Wehrmacht had time to bury, not always, in the beginning uh, as well. So we have sometimes cemeteries, like little cemeteries or little like graveyards with like 10 graves. Um, I read there was also one with 150 graves during the war already, um, as constructed by the military itself, so by the Germans itself. But most of the graves were scattered around the north of Luxembourg and of course in, in the Bastogne, uh, in Belgium, etc. Et, et um, so here on the right side, there was, uh, it was taken uh, after the war, but you can see here still grave signs, even it was easy, but still you had to cut them, you had to put them together, you had to glue them together, somebody had to write the names on it, somebody like had like a um, template to put like this uh, iron cross on it, but they put the names down. So you can still see who's lying there. And then on the left side, uh, this was also uh, what, many, many, many cases that um, the bodies were not buried at all. Uh, of course, and especially then in the last weeks of the battle when the, the German Wehrmacht had to retreat, um, they were just lying there. So like that, the soldiers, this is a German soldier. It's sad, yeah. And it's, um, well, you can see he's frozen and um, try to dig a grave or if you are on a run or if you if, if you don't have the time. It's not summer like in the Crimean Island. You're not on the beach. You don't have the possibility to bury the soldier. So in this um, little graveyards, like on the right side, um, were, like I said, scattered around uh, the north. And, and Nina, with the, with the um the Ardennes offensive, we, we talked uh, with Peter Kadic Adams a couple of weeks ago about this massive, great tale, the logistics that's coming in behind. The Germans had fifty thousand horses as part of their advance. When they're bringing supplies forward, is there any kind of process to remove? I'll be obviously the wounded if if they can are being taken backwards. But are are there are there any attempts to bring back the dead when when these supply convoys go forward? Do they go back? I mean, they're not going to go back empty. Are they taking back the dead, or are the dead always going to be buried where they found if they're buried at all? Always buried where they died. This was the official order, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always exception, right? Always. Um, I know some uh, that even in the beginning of a war, right, the, the Wehrmacht was like, you know, like the like the Blitzkrieg um, moved fast, uh, that even families went to the front and <laughs> digged out their sons and put brought them home. So this was possible. Then it was completely forbidden. No, it was from the Wehrmacht, it was completely, completely forbidden to repatriate them. So there was uh, like the idea, there was a discussion about repatriate uh, the fall after the war. So this was already like discussing, but they said they should be buried 
where they died and together with uh, the comrades with the, who they fought as well. So this was always like, like the idea. So um, there was always the idea to, to rebury them later on, but to bury them together in military cemeteries, in soldier cemeteries, in this warrior cemeteries. They kind of put like an, um, like a, this, this idea c came already from the Second World War, and especially from the 20s, from the radical, um, well, this right wing uh, ideological part already, like this um, revenge um, idea of the First World War soldiers. But even they, they died, they are waiting for the call to get up, to get up again and fight again. So it was like the cemeteries were kind of um, also considered as fortresses or fortresses like they, that the soldiers were put to sleep and they were just waiting for the call on the hill like uh, Hitler, right, uh, that they well, got up or uh, resurrect and fight again. So this is also the idea of the Wehrmacht that um, this was like this um, cemetery, like an aura, like a special place where like the heroes of the fatherland are buried and they should be buried with their comrades together because like I said they are um well, they fought together in the unit and that's why they should stay in the unit and also then rest forever in this unit so it was um kind of never fought really and also the soldiers i mean i know that um, uh, the americans did that they offered that uh was of course very expensive already in this in the first world war but the germans never thought about it and even uh now um the, about the data of the second world war i heard that a lot um even in the netherlands or here in west europe why the germans don't take them home or somewhere and uh, even in russia what should, why are they still lying here? Um, and why, why not, why does Germany not take them home? But this was never the idea, never. Even, and like Wehrmacht even forbade it to, to bring them back because they, they said, we put them, we rather transport or transfer the injured back or like equipment back for, to repair, I don't know. And they don't want, they didn't want to overload the transfer uh, like infrastructure, like the transfer, somewhere, whatever. So it wasn't okay. a plan at all. Good stuff. Um, moving on. So uh, and yeah, and and it's just what to to recap there. Of course, the other thing we haven't had, well we we're going to address in a minute is of course you were saying there about this aim the Germans had had for having permanent cemeteries if their army is victorious if they win World War II, but clearly. When we get to the era of the Ardennes and the Battle of the Bulge Offensive, it's it's pretty clear that Germany is not going to win the World War II. So, so are they beginning to think that what might happen to their cemeteries overseas, or are they just not going to start thinking about that? They're still thinking that victory is possible. I think in, at the at that time, just uh, fought militarily. Just, just um, not about the dead anymore. I mean, yes, burying, yes, of course, but um, just hoping to win the war. Hoping to win. No, so I don't have any records, but but what they that showed me with what um, was the idea, like uh, like um, well, the retreat. Okay. Just back and just to collect um, strength and new new troops to go back to the west okay so so um, what's this photo we're looking at here yeah uh, we have to also to consider that luxembourg was um de facto annexed yeah was part of the german reich but yeah, de facto a part of it so it was kind of a were buried home at home right. yeah yeah so, so what are we looking at here what's this photo nina mm -hmm. yes this is um graves i guess or said like german graves um buried what well, no sorry um little little graveyards after the war and still standing so this is something um also like you can see a little bit it's very blurry but you can see um there's like a steel helmet still on on the grave so you can see 
that the Wehrmacht, of course, had the time a little bit to bury them. You can even see like they used like one of the templates for the, the on the steel helmet, under the steel helmet, there is like this iron cross. Um, but even after 46, 47, there is still them. So they're not looted. So this is what I wanted to show that they are still like um, identifiable, like, still um, can be reburied. So this is like the, the, the requirement for the next slide. Uh, this is like a short excursion to other um, burials. And here, I mean like the enemy <laughs> dead, yeah. mostly POWs and also crash pilots. Um, the pilots I will talk about on the next slide. So like I already said, on based on the Geneva Convention, it was um, the prisoners of war had to be treated equal, right? They had to be like offered um, uh, food and, and of course like um, treatment even in, in um, when they died. And here it's a very rare picture I found um, unfortunately, without a date, um, but it's definitely during the war in Germany. So here we have a burial of a French POW. And you can see that it's it's in Germany. I mean, we know that it's in Vinzen, it's in Germany. So he is buried in, on, at a, uh, on a civil cemetery with a lot of wreaths and flowers. And uh, the, his comrades uh, of this French POW are standing there in their uniforms. And um, next to that is also like a um, guard, uh, like a salute uh, for of the Wehrmacht, what I found very, very interesting. On the right side, you can see that a German soldier is actually like uh, honoring or just burying, gives like the last honors uh, in, in uh, putting earth on the grave. So this is very rare because um, the Nazis didn't treat every POW like that. They uh, treated also Americans, well, that, like, uh, also uh, like the French, like Italians and the British, but not from the East, Eastern Europe. Mostly uh, Soviets and Polish QWs. Um, I mean, you know, uh, all, all of us know that the Soviet QWs are like the second largest victim group. And uh, they had of even regulations how to bury them. So for the POWs, it was also like last uh, military honors, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also with the um, religious ceremony, like here with the um, with, with a priest, this was important. But for the Soviets, uh, they should be buried in, in the dark. Nobody should see that without a priest uh, in single grave, if possible. But just with a little stick on it, like a grave um, mark with a number on it, and that's it. Wow. So, of course, we know many were just just starved to death, or were just overworked, or were even transferred to concentration camps. So they were even buried in mass graves, and nobody know even what happened to them. They the death was registered by the a civil office in the town because most of the um, um, PW camps were like on the German ground, and they were like, of course register the dead but anyway this was like this big big difference i wanted to show and to, to em mm. emphasize that that's like um this picture is very rare and then there are a lot of um other dead not qws not captured but uh the german po population as well had to deal somehow with uh crashed pilots from mostly from the british air force and americans died or even sometimes survived and it's kind of like a movie how they hid in the forest or something but here it's also uh, one case in luxembourg because here we have um the royal air force and like six of them died in a crash this plane was uh, coming back from karlsruhe so it was uh, to bomb karlsruhe it was in the uh, southwest of germany so it's very close to the German border, this uh, plane crashed. And it's probably still not proven, but maybe by a flash. So it was maybe like hit by a flash and then uh, of course um, caught fire and then crashed in uh, the little village in Niederdonben. And what happened, I found very interesting, uh, is that the, there was like an investigation. There was like you, um, even on the right picture, you can see uh, like there's like a, Wehrmacht officer is, is standing 
over the um, ruins of this plain, and then there uh, is there's the burial. These pilots were buried in the town and at the civil cemetery, and it was just off, uh, just ordered, just please bury them quick, and that's it. But also, of course, we have a Christian ceremony. So um, the uh, village uh, bought, uh, like, uh, got them um, coffins. Uh, like they handcrafted them, they crafted them, and they were considered for, like the British as like the heroes because, like I said, Luxembourg was occupied. So the, the Germans were like the enemies, also for the Luxembourgish people. But still, the Wehrmacht kind of gave the six six uh, crew members like the last. Honors. Um, on the next picture, uh, on the next slide, Paul, thank you. You can see it's very, very blurry, but it's on the left side. You can see there's like a big, uh, like, uh, like mm, the priest with his help, helpers. And then is um, as the guards, the Wehrmacht guards, like uh, shoot like a south, like a salute into yeah. the air. So they kind of gave them the last honors. And you can see. For the Luxembourgish, six crew members were heroes and they came and gathered around. Um, this episode is very, very interesting. Um, they used this as like a martyr. So they even like had like a pilgrimage to the grave. So um, they put more and more flowers on it and more. And people came from uh, from far away and even the resistance put some like refs on it. And the Wehrmacht was so annoyed that they in the dark, they removed uh, uh, the graves completely, like secretly, silent, and uh, put them somewhere. And they didn't tell anybody where the six graves went. Well, and then after the war, the British, um, uh, the Commonwealth um, Commission, uh, War Grave Commission. Graves, yeah. Yes. Thank you. They found them uh, behind the German border in uh, somewhere in a small village in Germany. But this is also what I, I wanted to uh, share, that even we're talking here about not the Battle of Balch, definitely, but it's still the war going on. And the Wehrmacht still gave them like the last honors, but they didn't want that the population uses this as like an anti-German mm. movement, but well, they, they did kind of. And uh, so that's why they were like, and they removed them in the end um, because it was like too much of the like uh, contra propaganda for the Germans. Right. Okay. Okay. Very shortly. I know time is running um, after the battle. So you can see here that, of course, in the north um, after the battle of Balch in Luxembourg, like in Belgium, uh, the cities were completely destroyed. Um, you can see bridges um, like Basilica and streets, and also uh, last cemeteries of the Germans. So the cemeteries here on the right side uh, were, were constructed by the, by the by the Germans themselves. But of course, here you can see they are of course a little bit uh, well, of course suffered. I would say as well. But this was like the status quo after the war, after the battle. Next slide, please. And I couldn't find a picture from Luxembourg more, uh, but here I want just to show you that um, if, of course, nobody takes care of the graves, like here in Flanders, and you can see here, maybe this was a grave which was like cr created in the beginning of the war because they spit the templates with graves, uh, grave signs look quite nice, quite, yeah. uh, I mean, not nice, no, but Better. like the Better. template, yes, yeah. according according to the, uh regulation but you can see here after the war of course if nobody takes care of them they are um de decaying i mean you can yes it's um of course very easy just just to throw them over and then the um body was not going to be found because if you don't know there's like a body on under the, the, the sign uh nobody will know um this was in western europe a different thing, um, of course, there's many cases in France, for example, they all, the population removed the crosses, not as much as in Russia, um, but because in uh, Russia, because between um, 44, 45 and 1992, 
nobody could uh, had access to the former German cemeteries, German Wehrmacht cemeteries in, in Russia. So now it's still uh, the exhumation procedure is still going on in Russia while this exhumations works efforts are kind of finalized then in Western Europe. Because the Germans got then very fast um, access to the cemeteries, but still not directly after the war. Next slide, please. Here we have, for example, an, um, a sketch from like the, from the US infantry regiment. Because like I said, um, after the war, not well, nobody took care of the graves, of the German graves. But the Americans um, reburied many, and they constructed the first permanent cemetery for the Second World War here in Luxembourg. So they kind of started, and you can see here it's also very very blurry, but it's you can see here it's like in the in the north of Luxembourg. It's in, in it's in Hosingen, and uh, you can see there's like a, a street just mentioned, and there's like said like German graves, and then. US graves. So of course they were looking after the battle. They were looking for uncovered bodies, right? So after the winter and then in 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 March, May, when they had you know finally then the time or finally then the possibility to look for bodies, to look for graves like unregistered graves. And while searching for their um, comrades, of course, they found many, many, many German graves. So that's why they started reburying uh, also German um, graves already. Not all of them, because in the end, uh, now on the permanent cemetery, there are almost two, two, uh, no, 12,000 German graves. Um, but uh, this was, this came later. But they, in the beginning, they recovered. 6,000, almost 6,000 6, German graves uh, from all over, mostly from the north of Luxembourg. The locals, um, I, I will, um, uh, this is on the next slide. Ah, okay, this is uh, like another example. I wanted to show you, uh, this is an example from um, Walter Maya. He was uh, buried by the Germans, uh, by the Wehrmacht itself in Hosingen. But then, he was reburied and got like a provisional grave in Hosingen as well. And then he was reburied again to the permanent cemetery. So you can see, so um, I, will, I will tell you that about what the, um, so the Americans, of course, reburied many, many um, German graves already or buried or recovered for the first time also, of course, German bodies because like the German retreat, of course, uh, they didn't have time to uh, bury everybody. But uh, the most of them were, were already, like I said, buried in graves. And then they kind of reburied them, not all of them, into the permanent cemetery. But here, this example shows he, he kind of had three graves, like first from the Germans, then again, like another one uh, with, with like a cross on it. Um, many reburials after the war happened also um, or were conducted by German prisoners of war. Right. So they were also used uh, either by the Luxembourg government and of course by the Americans uh, uh, to rebel them. And this sign here was made by German prisoners of war. I'm not mistaken completely, but so, but this is this example that like, like he had like three different graves and until he got like his graves at the permanent cemetery. So this is also this um, screenshot like, of, of this modern written um, picture is like a database extract of yeah. the permanent cemetery, of the database uh, of the permanent cemetery here in Luxembourg in Sandweiler. And then the other is, um, yeah, was a not notification of the, uh, to the family yeah. that he died. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, this is, I mean, I mentioned that already, just not um, necessary. Next slide, please. Exactly. 
And then, uh, so after the war, what I already said, so of course not every German soldier could be buried because uh, well, re retreated or they, they didn't, or they, the body wasn't being found, right? So some of them, of course, like went to, <laughs> were not just maybe missed in, in action. Maybe he, he died of injuries and uh, will, will died just in the forest and uh, nobody has a possibility to bury him. So of course, maybe any American soldiers. And like I said, locals recovered a lot of bodies, not all, not just bodies uh, of humans or soldiers, but also many, many animals. So um, there were like, complaints about that this like this um, decaying bodies were polluting the air, uh, polluting the, uh, the water as well. So there were many, um, uh, for example, provisional graves uh, in also civil cemeteries, but also in just next to a farm, next to a tree, somewhere, just just somewhere. And and then of course they needed after the war to start looking what is there or to collect the German graves to, together. So in the first years after the war, um, like Smirch authorities didn't do much. Of course they were busy with their own lives. Definitely, um, they were uh, had to um, up, build up again their cities, and and of course uh, many um, fled the countries so were looking for the loved ones and not for German graves. So, but still, um, we have here again this Geneva Convention coming into terms, coming into power here. For example, um, so um, the official government, well, the government kind of uh, wrote. But to all municipalities in the north, do we have German graves? Because we have to take care of them. By the way, so we have to take care of them. What are they? I mean, do you know what is there? Because uh, Germany is asking already, and this was like in the 49 and already 50, like five years after, and you you can see that this, even the, this wood of the crosses started to decay, just started you know, to fall to to fall over. So they were kind of forced by the Geneva Convention as well, and of course, uh, diplomatically, to mm. check what is there. So they were like kind of um, asked um, to make like a list. So in this uh, above, in on this orange red um, uh, screenshot, there's like a list of um, soldiers. And we have here like a cemetery of 100, over 100. So, and the German, uh, sorry, the Luxembourgish municipality knew exactly who was buried there because they were like, even like um, reading the signs, uh, like who's, well, who's here, who uh, well, does he come from? And of course, then the Red Cross asked, keep, like, started asking for the uh, relatives, for example, because many, uh, they never heard about their sons because maybe in the last um, weeks, the this Wehrmacht information service didn't work anymore correctly. So some of them never known what happened to their husbands or brothers. So that's why they, they started asking uh, via the Red Cross. And some of them, of the families uh, started writing to the Luxembourg government. So, La so Luxembourg was kind of pressured to take to take um, well, to take action to to do something. So that's why they wrote to every municipality that they said you have to do something. So either we rebury them, so we put them in in like in in, in like uh, collecting cemeteries. So we have to collect them. So we have another um, little sketch here that they a municipality started also to build or to let's say not build, but to repair about a little bit about this, this cross. So they started, you know, you can see it's very, very simple, but still they started to repair a little bit of one of the little graveyards the German Wehrmacht already constructed during the war. So they were kind of forced to that. And so, then so essentially, Nina, there's, there's kind of two phases. So the, the first bodies from the Battle of the Bowls would have been found at the time of the fighting, either by American soldiers or by by locals, and then in that immediate post-war period, they're trying to reconstruct their cities and towns. But also, as you're putting electricity back on, or water back on, or you're clearing, you're finding bodies as part of that process. And then the late 40s, there becomes this official 
um, beginning of searching for the bodies specifically. So, so bodies had been found earlier, but they were kind of found accidentally. And now there's this actual plan in process to look for them. Is that the two phases? Exactly. Yes, it's exactly. So right after the war, when they found still um, un well, unburied bodies, they just put them because it was faster into mass graves. Fast, yeah. very, and sometimes they even they wanted to fill up holes or they want to just, you know, be sort of explosive. So they used this already digged um, holes as mass graves and put also other garbage inside. Uh, mines, uh, I mean, rusty things, what's like left from, from war, everything. I mean, what is a, a soldier has, um, right? Like stuff <laughs> from, from tanks, etc. So still a few years ago, um, uh, like a colleague of mine found in Hosingen, where I have like uh, a lot of uh, material here, found like uh, mass graves with, um, I think it was over 50 soldiers uh, inside. But they were not, identif not identifying well anymore. That's the problem. So they had to be buried in the mass grave in, on the permanent German cemetery in Luxembourg. But they were reburied. So at least but bad. But still, yes, with uh, municipalities were pressured. And then in '52, uh, Luxembourg signed a binational, like binational agreement with the Federal Republic of Germany. So it was like um, that uh, Germany gets the possibility to exhume other cemetery, right. like other graves. And that the already, um, I think on the next slide, we can see the cemetery uh, built by the Americans. Yes, this is the cemetery uh, for the Germans built by the Americans for around 6,000. The Americans also chose a cemetery next to uh, this little village in Hamm. I mean, maybe if you are, of course, uh, re read something of Battle of Balsh, you know what the cemetery in Hamm looks like. Um, but I started also to separating, of course, the mass graves, because in some mass graves, they open up, they, they found American soldiers, because well, sometimes course, you know, yeah. they're just very fast, put them inside and whatever, just close it and no next. And um, but they built that cemetery for the German soldiers. And that's the agreement of from fifty two. Uh, German government got officially access to this cemetery, so they uh, got the land, and they have now the uh, they have uh, these graves have an, an an eternal resting right. So this is like um, written in every agreement uh, with also with um, France, Belgium, Netherlands, and also with Russia. Uh, so they have it, and this is was important because this is like kind of kind of a continuation of the Geneva Conventions because also the Geneva Convention says eternal resting right. Uh, so because these graves have, should never be removed, and also these graves, of course, it changed. The cemetery changed because the then the Germans started to exhume, like systematically, other little graveyards. I mean, here you see it's 6,000, now it's the double size. So the Germans then, of, especially in the 50s, started to exhume systematically um, the other German graves, or also if uh, there was a construction going on. And still today, uh, they find sometimes bones. And then it's of course difficult for so is it American, is it German, or is it a civilian? Could also be a civilian. Well, mostly it's, it's a soldier. And then they call, of course, authorities. And um, Nick, this year in spring, there will be an, another exhumation of German graves in the okay. north. So it's still like a continuation, like case by case. But but anyway, so with this agreement, Germany like got the cemetery and also like the responsibility for the cemetery so germany uh, it's a good to ask the question where, where did they get the land from did they have to buy it from locals was it already government owned land how did they get the land for the cemeteries yeah um case to case different this land is not did they buy it no it's they are how do you say not um not renting. Kind of <laughs> not requisitioned. Not renting. Sorry? Requisitioned. Yeah, right yes, exactly. While the community or the municipality of Ham gave, donated the land. 
to the Americans. Okay. Yeah. So they gave it to the Americans, but they kind of had it requisitioned for the Germans. It's a yes. slight yes. legal legal yes. difference there. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, so yeah, this is the uh, original plan of uh, St. Weiler. Uh, the cemetery is right really like next to, next, around the corner to Ham. Uh, quite a difference <laughs> um, from the white marble stones uh, from the American cemetery and here like this grave today, like almost 12,000 graves, single and mass graves. Even you don't see many grave signs, but uh, they are single graves underneath the lawn. And in the middle, there's like a mass graves. Uh, the German like to call it comrade grave. Mass grave sounds like, um, for them, like uh, maybe like in a concentration camp, I don't know. Yeah, but it sounds more like a genocidal. The mass grave mm -hmm. sounds like something from a genocide, whereas a, uh, uh, yeah, interesting the use of language. And but you said earlier that right at the beginning, when the Germans began to bury their dead at the beginning of the war, they always wanted to have these individual graves. But we know from German cemeteries in Normandy and, and the Netherlands is that often it's six or four or eight to a grave. When did they decide they would have to? not have individual was it just a practicality issue because of the limited funds or was there a was there a reason for the changeover no no it's not a change so the the majority of of these graves are single graves right i'm single but uh the bones or the remains they couldn't identify they have to put into mass graves it's, it's either not it's not possible i mean you cannot say yeah. like the arm belongs to schmidt and the other arm belongs to miller so they, they, that's why they put them into mass graves. For example, many, uh, what I said now about this mass graves, the locals did after the war, you, you cannot identify them anymore. Even you know who was inside, maybe you find like a dog tag, but the dog tag maybe could be somewhere completely different. So uh, they know who's in there, but they, don't, they cannot identify the exact remains, the exact bones. Yeah, with, yeah. You know, no, no, they, they still keep um, individual graves. This is still like this um, regulation, still the, the guideline, still. Okay, are you moving on, next one? Yes. Okay, um, like I said, the exhumation, the systematic exhumation is um, finalized. It's, it's done in Western Europe, but of course the uh, German authorities are called from time to time. But this is a picture from uh, even a few weeks ago in December, and there they found a German cemetery because you can see here it's in Poland. Uh, you can see here this remains are systematically like laid down, so it's, it was a, it was a, a grave, not a mass grave, because mass grave was probably completely chaotic. But here you can see this was a grave, and. Uh, here, because of a Cold War, I mean, I can um, also talk about it uh, over one hour um, about this uh, this politics or this this um, grave um, works in Eastern Europe. It wasn't the, the German authorities couldn't get access to this uh, sites to the sites. While the Luxembourg, uh, it started already, you know, in in well, um, the Americans did a lot. Uh, the locals as well, and then the Germans could start even in 49 or 50 earlier, but in the 50s, definitely. So they could uh, still, you could still see graves. But here, for example, even this could have been identifiable, right? But if you didn't have access and then everybody, then you forget, uh, then maybe people are dying, they don't know anymore. And then the for construction, um, Sites they find graves, and this happened a lot in Eastern Europe. Yeah, this is what I wanted to, to uh, close also with my last slide um, about exhumations. It's, it's another um, lecture, I guess. But here, a last, a last um, uh, quote from uh, from General uh, from Russia: "Our war is only over when the last soldier is buried." I don't know. <laughs> I think kind of it's it's over, but still it's so surprising. I, that's why I still it's still fascinating. It's it's history, but it's practical. It's up to date. It's current. It's it's still um, so. I don't know what will happen this summer. Uh, let's see. Um, I mean, what uh, others will find 
in the earth exactly yeah and mm -hmm. and so you're, you're you're working on this right now you're working on a, on, a, yes. on a book about that because as i said to you before we went live folks one of the things as a normandy tour guide and i know there are people watching who are tour guides in belgium and the netherlands it's there's a lack of information about how the german system worked i mean we we know there's some people watching from the commonwealth war graves commission it's all there we understand the process we understand how they they transfer from being a temporary cemetery to a permanent cemetery. The American Battle Monuments Commission have a huge amount of information on their website about how their system works. But although there are websites about the German system, it seems there's a lot more um, mystery isn't perhaps the right word, a lot more confusion about exactly how it works. And from my point of view, anything that starts getting some of this truth out there is is, is important work. Um, so in Luxembourg, where you are, you said that they're still they're still at, they're still finding the dead from the war um is it is it reg are they looking for the dead or are they finding them when there's perhaps a building project going on yes they're not looking systematically i mean i have a colleague who is very interested in that topic as an amateur historian but he's he knows sometimes from the registration from for example um we know who died here or who was missing in action this is this is this is clear. I mean, if, if this soldier never came home and the last unit was the regiment something something and this took this regiment took part in Battle of the Bulge and it's clear he died somewhere here. So we know, of course, of records of research of um, witness reports that barely uh, in my garden there are like two, uh, two graves. So there are still sometimes people stepping up and saying, ah, I remember my grandmother told me that. So of course, uh, so it's little details. So you're dependent on information, but uh, the um, German War, War Graves Commission. <clears throat> this is the uh, responsible body who uh, is responsible for the cemeteries, to the maintenance, and to, for the exhumations. They don't look systematically anymore. They don't. And this uh, work is over yeah. here in Western and officially. And it's part of it is funding, isn't it? Part of it because if they start looking, there's you know, especially in the Eastern Front, there's potentially lots that they could still find, and it's just where would the budget come from? And we get that question in Normandy, and um, there are still occasionally projects sent over. Normally, independently funded foundations send people over to look for the missing. There are still some missing U.S. in Normandy, some bit, but if they started looking for the, all the missing Germans, it could be a potentially never-ending task because as you say mm -hmm. there although that quote there the war is not over there are still tens of thousands missing hundreds of thousands from world war ii but um brilliant, brilliant presentation so um uh we, we we talked about you coming back on at some point in the future and talking about the civilian experience in luxembourg because that's something else that i think is very interesting because we tend to disregard luxembourg uh, uh, we think of the ardennes as being belgium but as you said there and you mind us a lot of civilian deaths in luxembourg uh, the, the the fighting definitely was in Luxembourg, so it's it's the un, underappreciated uh, theatre of the war, I think, in that sense. So we'd love definitely have you come on for that. But um, uh, yeah, well, well, I think we're we're, we're done. So I, I really, I'll just remind people what we were coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, tomorrow evening, Peter Caddick Adams is coming on to finish off with a conclusion about the Ardennes. I do hope his dog turns up. His dog went missing last night. I hope Mr. Boar comes back. And then on Saturday, Jonathan Ware is coming on to pick up the show about the British Army in the Ardennes, the 53rd Welsh Division. That's on Saturday, so keep an eye. And then I'll be host posting, putting all my new shows up online on YouTube in the next few days. But right now, it means thank you, uh, me to say thank you very much, Dr. Nina Yans, for joining us. And um, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. So, um, um, happy New Year! And did you enjoy it? Thank you. Yeah, it was my well, it was a pleasure <laughs> to show share with you. And um, yeah, I hope that others are also um, learned a little bit more about the German burial system. And my book will be in English. Just Brilliant. Yeah. That. Well, we we can't wait to, to hear that or to buy that. It'll be really good. So there we are, folks. This is Paul Woodard from World War Two TV saying I will see you all hopefully tomorrow evening with Peter Gaddick Adams. Thank you very much for watching. As always, don't forget to support what we're doing, uh, share what we're doing on social media, Twitter, be, consider becoming a member of the channel. And of course, the link to Nina's website is in the description below. And above all else, thank you for joining everybody. I will see you all tomorrow night. Thanks, everybody. Bye.